There was a time, uh, this isn't true anymore, but there was a time when um, several years ago my daughter was just four years old and it was my responsibility every day to take her to preschool. And it was some of my favorite memories as a father, right? Taking her to preschool every day. We were late every day. Uh, it's just how I roll. And, uh, you know, a four-year-old, is, 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 we, we were just not punctual. There was um, one particular day that has stuck in my mind, my memories, for, for years now. It was a Friday morning when I was uh, driving her to preschool, and we were late, uh, as late as usual, and, and we drove up to the preschool, and there was clearly something special going on. Uh, it wasn't your average day. So there was a line of school buses, like the big yellow school buses, outside my daughter's preschool. This was just a preschool. They didn't do school buses. So something was going on, and my daughter knew exactly what was going on. Even though she was four, she knew that the line of school buses outside on a Friday morning meant it's field trip day. And my daughter, like most kids, has always loved field trips. And so she got excited and I got excited and we bounded out of the car past the school buses that were lined up outside the door. Uh, she saw her friends all in the school bus already and they were pressing their face against the glass and yelling her name and laughing and playing and whatever. And she got really excited and we went inside to get her checked in at the registration desk. And so I went in and, and, and I struck up a conversation with the, um, the, the woman that works there, a receptionist. And uh, I said, oh, it's field trip day. Like, how do I get my daughter um, signed up to go? Well, first I asked, first I asked, where are they going? <laughs> and she said, Chuck E. Cheese. And my daughter went nuts because she got to go to Chuck E. Cheese. I went nuts because I didn't have to go to Chuck E. Cheese. It's a win-win situation. And so she was excited. I was excited. I was like, where do I sign her up? And she said, well, I'm sorry, sir. But the doors on the buses are already closed. And I was like, you, you know how doors work, right? They're made to close and open and close and open again. It's like their whole purpose in life is <laughs> to close and open. They can open back up, right? I just didn't like how this conversation was headed. I knew where she was going. I didn't like the sound in her voice. But she continued. She said, well, we have a policy at the school that once the kids are boarded and the um, doors close, they can't be reopened unless there's some kind of emergency. And so I stood there thinking, what kind of emergency can I cause? Like right now, <laughs> and none, of, none of my ideas were legal. And so I just kept on thinking. And then she just piled on. Like she'd already made her point, but she felt like she had to say more. And she's, uh, the receptionist said, uh, well, uh, besides that, your daughter doesn't have the required field trip T-shirt on today. And I was like, That's, why do you have to say that? You've already told me we're not going. But anyway, more guilt. Okay, so. Besides, I see behind you, Miss Receptionist, a stack of said T-shirts. I will buy one off of you for any price right now. <laughs> Just name your price. I'm yours. Like, you can pocket the difference. I won't tell. It's good. And she was like, well, she has to have the shirt on when she boards the bus. And I was like, she's a pretty cooperative child. I could probably get it on her between here and the bus. It wouldn't be a problem. And she goes, well, the doors are closed. <laughs> so now we're just going round and round, right? And it's occurring to me that um, this is not going to turn out well for, for my daughter. Uh, she has her face sort of pressed against the glass of the front door, looking out at her friends on the buses as one by one they drive away. And I realize that because of some simple miscommunication, some silly rule, really, some misunderstanding, my daughter, my precious firstborn daughter, was going to spend that whole Friday watching Sesame Street reruns with five other kids whose parents don't love them, <laughs> and the stay-behind crowd on field trip day is always a sad, sad bunch at preschool, <laughs> and so she was going to be one of those, and I just... I couldn't help feeling this sort of range of emotions. I, I remember going through this sort of stages of grief, right? So um, the, first, the first thing I remember feeling was just this sort of uh, insufficiency as a father. Like I, I didn't have what it takes uh, to be a good father. And truth be told, that permission slip 
I should have signed was probably on my desk somewhere back home, like under a bunch of other papers or whatever. Like it was just me, you know, but I got over those feelings pretty quick. And it's amazing how quickly we can go from honest self-analysis to just sheer unadulterated blame and anger. And so that's how I, I progressed, right? So I end up just with rage. At this school, this rules are rules, the doors are closed, arbitrary, rigid, silly school, right? And I just got so mad at that receptionist. I just, I still think about her today. I just can't stop. Ugh, why, right? So there was this sort of, uh, this was me, right? I'm, I'm insufficient. And then there were, was this rage. And then something changed in my heart about this school, toward this school. And I'll tell you the moment that it changed. I know the exact moment I went from just anger at her, the receptionist, and the school, to just an agnostic apathy. And it was the moment that I saw my daughter's face pressed against that glass, looking out at those buses, leaving, and then I just kind of turned her around, and I, I got down on knee on her level, and I looked in her little four-year-old big brown eyes, and I could see her lips starting to quiver, and I just, it was awful. I just pulled her close, and there was, the tears started, and there was like snot everywhere, and then she looked at me, and she started crying too, and it was just like this awful situation <laughs> where you never forget how terrible it was, you know what I mean? And something in that moment with my four-year-old daughter in my arms, my heart changed to being just this apathetic, agnostic person toward the school. And that's the worst, right? That's way worse than anger. Like, I, I would much rather someone be mad at me, be outraged by me, than to be agnostic toward me. Once they get there, it's very hard to come back from. Because here they've decided I'm not worth even being mad at, <laughs> right? So that's... That's where I was. And you have to know that before that moment, if you had kids and you had asked me what we think about our daughter's preschool, I would have evangelized you so hard for that preschool. I would have told you, you've got to get in. You've got to get an interview. You've got to get in. It's the best place in Kansas City. It was in Kansas City. It was just a great location. They're always flexible. They meet our family's needs. You couldn't do better for your family. Before that moment, that's what I would have told you. But immediately after that moment, do you know what I would have told you if you'd come to me and said, what do you think of your daughter's preschool? Nah. It's okay, I guess. They've got these rigid rules, and the receptionist is just awful. She's just a witch. And, um, <laughs> but whatever. You know, it is what it is. Like my heart changed, right? And I've seen that happen before in myself, in other situations, and, and in other people. And as I've been um, writing these sermons, preparing for this series about um, people and the doubts we harbor about the Bible, it occurs to me that many people that I have come into contact with, some of y'all, have had the same range of emotions when it comes to your relationship to this book and to the people that love this book, to Christians, right, and to Christianity and to church. Like, you've had the same range of emotions. And what I mean by that is most of us, start out with a fairly benign view of the Bible. Like, it's got some great stuff in it. It's some nice things, good advice and stuff, right? Those are good. It's fine. Uh, I like it more than I don't like it, whatever. And then we grow up. We grow up and we start to read it for ourselves or we have people we trust in our lives who read it and then they tell us what kind of stuff is really in there. Or we come across something that's just really off-putting or disturbing or unsettling. And about the same time that we're growing up into adults and we're becoming our own men and women, right? We're kind of charting out our own life. We come across these disturbing or unsettling things in this book that we thought was really good because Miss Sally in Sunday school told us six times a year that we went to Sunday school that it was really good. And then we discover this stuff, and at the same time, we've got a Christian or group of Christians in our lives telling us that if we don't believe every word in this book, if we don't accept this book as the word of God, infallible, perfect, inerrant, and if you doubt it, you're putting your soul at risk. And not just of, you know, a little bit of punishment, but like punishment forever in the fires of hell. Like it seems like overkill, right? I just had a question. You know what I mean? And so you go through this, you go through this range of emotions from a, a sort of 
insufficiency about the Bible, like I'm no expert, I don't understand all of it, but it's fine, whatever, to, to uh, rage against the Bible and, and people that, um, that harp on it all the time and, and beat people over the head with it, use it as a weapon. And then people arrive at this place of agnostic apathy about the Bible, just like I did about that school. And I think a lot of people are there. Look, I think a lot of Christians are there. Because there are people that call themselves Christians, and I mean that generously, kindly as I can. People that have been born and raised in and around the church who've never really internalized the Bible or really dug into it yourself. Or maybe you tried and and failed and it just kind of fell apart. There are people who are trying to walk with Jesus that just really are agnostic about the Bible. And I understand it. I get it. There's real questions that we don't always address. So this series is about addressing those questions as honestly as we can. Today's question is, isn't the Bible too tainted to be trusted? Isn't the Bible too tainted to be trusted? And I wanted to sort of, uh, this is a big question, so I wanted to sort of parse it out into three different issues that I see in this question, which is uh, the people that wrote the Bible, who were these men, and uh, didn't they have their own agendas? And if they had their own agendas, why should we trust them? The second question is about the translations of the Bible, and isn't the Bible corrupted by translations? And the third question is, isn't the Bible internally inconsistent and fatally flawed? I'm going to spend less than 10 minutes going on all three of these. I'm serious. Don't laugh. And then I'm going to tell you why figuring out these three questions, subplot questions, isn't as important as it may seem. (laughs) All right? So... The next 10 minutes, it's not really that important is what I'm saying. Okay, so it just uh, you got to stay with me, though, because I'm going to tell you why, okay? So the first question is about the people that wrote the Bible. Who were these people? I've told you that there's 40 of them in past sermons in this series, 40 different authors of these 66 books. Who were they, and did they have some kind of conspira- conspiracy, some kind of, uh, you know, secret agenda that they shared that they were wanting to pull a, a fast one on the rest of us with? So um, we know uh, that the, the person who wrote the most books in the Bible was the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote 13 books of the Bible, starting with the book of Romans, going all the way through Philemon. And they're ordered in that way because it goes from longest to shortest. That's why they're ordered in that way in the New Testament. And uh, when Paul wrote these letters, he didn't seem to know that he was writing the Bible. He was writing letters. He was writing mail to his friends. And we got it, and then we read it every time we read that part of the Bible. You're reading mail. It's a federal offense, and you don't even get arrested for reading it because God is a God of grace. And that's Paul's mail. And he, he, he writes to his, to his friends and constituents and fellow Christians, all right? So he writes 13 of these books, but who is Paul? Well, what the Bible tells us about Paul isn't pretty. He spent the first half of his life hating, persecuting, and watching over the murderers of the first Christians. He hated them. He was a Pharisee, and he thought that it was his duty to protect Orthodox Phariseeism from this heresy called Christianity. Right? And then he had an experience with Jesus, and obviously his life was interrupted. His life changed. He wrote 13 books. Now, there were three guys that wrote five books of the Bible. The first one um, that I'll uh, tell you about was John in the New Testament. Now, John could not have been more different from Paul. Paul was this kind of He had this rogue past, and Jesus called him like the least likely character to write most of the, or half the books of the New Testament. John would have been the most likely. He was Jesus' best friend. He was Mary's adopted son. Mary grew old in John's house. He wrote five books of the Bible. So did Moses. Moses wrote five books of the Bible, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But I have it on... Uh, I I have a a pretty good idea about Moses and those five books of the Bible. I don't think he wrote all of those five books of the Bible. This is just a little inside baseball stuff, but you know how I know that Moses didn't write all five of those books of the Bible. Example number one, I submit to you Deuteronomy 34, where Moses supposedly wrote that um, that day Moses died in Moab, and then there are seven more verses After that, it seems unlikely to me that Moses would have written that part of that book of Moses. And there was this other passage in Numbers, in Numbers chapter 12, where Moses purportedly wrote, uh, 
Moses was the most humble man who ever walked the face of the earth. Moses was a very humble man. Now, that seems uh, problematic to me. If Moses actually (laughs) wrote that, either somebody wrote that about Moses or Moses just didn't quite understand the concept of humility (laughs) to call himself the most humble man to walk the face of the earth. But it's pretty clear that Moses wrote most of those first five books. Beyond that, who were the other authors of the Bible? Most of them just wrote one book apiece. And they ranged, um, they, they, they really spanned the globe geographically. Three different continents, Europe, Africa, Asia. They were separated by 1,600 years time, writing in disparate times, chronologically separated. They were uh, divided politically at times. And theologically, they understood things differently. And those differences come out in their writings. Listen, some of these guys were kings and war generals. Some of them were peasants and fishermen. Some of them were murderers and adulterers. Some of them were Jesus's half brothers, right? Some of them were highly educated. Some of them were illiterate and needed a scribe to transcribe their book that they wrote. But very few of these Bible authors knew any of the other Bible authors. <laughs> which sort of tears down the idea that they could have been in cahoots, that over 1,600 years' time, these 40 men got together somehow across time and space to come up with this grand conspiracy theory to pull a fast one on the rest of us. It seems problematic at best. Now, the second um, uh, issue that's brought up here is the translation issue. Uh, There are people that have very strong opinions about the translation. I had one guy tell me, uh, he brought his Bible to this meeting, and he was like, this Bible has been translated like a thousand times. He's not wrong, but he's misguided in his understanding. What What he thinks that means is that his Bible has gone through a thousand translations over time. Not that the Bible has been translated into a thousand languages. Those are different things. You get what I'm saying? So your Bible, if you have like an NIV Bible or NRSV or some kind of a, a, what I call like a sturdy translation, not one of those newfangled things that don't have verse numbers on them. So the, the, the idea here is that your Bible, it's not a retranslation of a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation. These um, translations like the NIV and others that we can rely on, they went back as early as they could to the earliest manuscripts. They didn't just rewrite King James and take out all the thous and thys. Thank goodness. They went back before King James and and took a look at the earliest manuscripts. And listen, like the earliest manuscripts, the the evidence is super strong. And I don't want to belabor this point, but... Nobody really questions the validity or consistency of the Old Testament. They took such good care of their parchment scrolls. And it was such a closed community in those days, the Jewish community, that no one ever says, hey, that the, there are too many discrepancies between different accounts. That's not how it worked in the Jewish community. The New Testament has come under more fire, more criticism um, uh, than the Old Testament has. But even the New Testament has uh, an incredible amount of evidence in its in support of it. So we have 14,000 ancient manuscripts that have been recovered over um, those three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, right? So all in ancient languages, we have 5,000 in um, Greek, 8,000 in Latin, 1,000 other manuscripts or fragments of manuscripts in other ancient languages dating back to as early as 117 AD. Now we don't have the original Uh, copies, right? And this is where skeptics are all like, aha, I knew it. You don't have the originals, I'm out. Listen, okay, we'll give you that one. But you have all these other manuscripts dating back as early as 117 AD and the other ones in the second and third centuries that fill out the New Testament and that were written in, you know, six or more different languages that have been recovered compared to each other and they line up at a rate of 99.5% Um, matching, right? So 99.5% of their words and lines match perfectly. That's a really weird coincidence. It's a phenomenon, right, that these, these disparate copies would line up to that extent of perfection, near perfection. So out of 1,000 words, 995 words would be the same. Five words would be different, and a lot of those times the words was like he wrote of and he wrote if, 
and they misspelled that name, and they misspelled that place, right? So anyway, this, this conversation has been going on forever about the translations, and really, really smart people, smarter people than me, have fallen uh, down on the Christian side of it, and others have fallen down on the other side of it, and we just keep arguing about the translations. Let's go back to the third question, though, because I think this is a serious one for a lot of us. The Bible is internally inconsistent, or it's fatally flawed. Internal inconsistencies would refer to the things we've been talking about the last few weeks. Genesis 1 and 2, telling the creation story in different ways. Right? Now, what I want you to think about, if you're a skeptic, is you've already made the point that the Bible's been translated and retranslated, and the point you're making is that the Bible's been whitewashed. If they really had a concerted conspiracy theory sort of effort to whitewash the Bible, do you think they would have left two different creation stories that leave room for that kind of questioning? You don't think they would have shored that up? Have you ever read the Old Testament? Does it read like something that's been whitewashed? Of course not. It's messy. Intentionally. Messy. Right? So Bible scholars have always known that stuff is there. Some of the other seeming like uh, contradictions or disparities are when uh, the Old Testament law says this and Jesus says this. The Old Testament law says you must keep the Sabbath holy. And Jesus is like, look, if you're hungry, go pick some food and eat it on the Sabbath. Even though that's technically work, Sabbath was made for the man and man was not made for Sabbath. All right? So the Jesus seems to, you know, say something different there. And then the New Testament Christians are like, woohoo! All the bets are off. Like Romans 14, Paul says, some of y'all keep the Sabbath. Some of you don't keep the Sabbath. It's all good. And and so it's like, if you're a skeptic, which is it? I need some structure here. Like if you're, especially if you're like an OCD skeptic, like you can't stop your brain from thinking like, oh my goodness, which do I have to follow here? And then you reach that agnostic place of not even caring because it's overwhelming. Some of the questions about Number three, go even, or even broader. It's not just like little nitpicky things. It's like big theme things. Some of you resist the Bible because supposedly God wrote it. It's God's word. And purportedly, God is a God of love. But you look at the Bible and you don't see enough love. You see a lot of hate. You see hellfire, you see violence, you see vengeance, but you don't see enough love to justify giving this book your time, all right? So I'm going to take a step back from those three arguments and just say this. All of them are okay conversations to have. All of them are arguments that have been going on for centuries, and no one's minds are ever changed by having the argument. I haven't said anything today, and I could go on and on about the facts of the matter. I, could, I haven't said anything today that's going to change your mind. No one here has gone, oh, there were manuscripts. I'm in now. No one does that, right? But people argue and argue and argue. And listen, it, I just find it incredibly boring. I tried to dress it up and make it fun. It, I failed. But I, I find it incredibly boring. I sit here and arguing about, well, this says this and this says, okay. But no one's life is changed by the arguments. You know uh, what the 40 Bible authors actually did have in common with each other? It wasn't their roots or their country of residence or the language they spoke. It was that all of them shared an openness to an experience of God that interrupted their lives. Every single one of them had an experience of God that interrupted their lives, and they allowed that to come. That doesn't happen when you're over here in the agnostic camp. Because being agnostic is all about just status quo, man. I don't need to think deeper. I don't need to have more meaningful conversations. I'm just, I'm I'm good. Being agnostic is not being open to the interruption of God. And writ large, the Bible story is really a story about God interrupting human life in the form of Jesus. And so we should look at the whole story God tells in the Bible through the lens of this interruption. And what did it mean? I want to do that with the last few minutes of our time together. If you have a Bible or your study guide, I invite you to open it now. Um, Genesis 22. I want to look real close at one of uh, the most commonly 
uh, discussed, most frequently despised stories in all the Bible. Genesis 22 is the story of the time that God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Y'all know that one? It's a feel-good story, right? This is one of the stories that um, people that are true skeptics and cynics about Christianity and religion will bring up first. This is the kind of thing that makes me not believe. You know, right? That's what I hear. And you love people and know people that feel the same way. Let's look at this story from Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am. Abraham replied. And then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. And we will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? It's a very awkward conversation, I would imagine. Uh, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. If we could stop there for just a second, we go back. Most people who despise this story or who are horrified by this story, in their minds, they stop here. How could a loving God even require this of someone he loves? The sacrifice of a son. What kind of a God is this even, right? But that's not where the story ends. The story goes on. Follow along with me. This is the rest of the story. So when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now that I know you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide, and to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. That's the end of the story of Abraham and Isaac. Now some of y'all are like, I'm still, I, I don't get it. And I understand <laughs> some of y'all are like, he still told him to do it. And he still, it seems like a cruel test. And truly, I tell you, in the silo, if you read Abraham's story on its own, yeah, there's some problems, some real problems there. But listen, Abraham and his son, Isaac, they are part of a greater story we are to read through the lens of Jesus. I want to teach you how to do that. Just one example here. So you take Abraham, and then you look for other examples of this kind of story. The, the idea that God would provide a sacrifice is unique to Abraham at this point in the Bible. So where does that idea go from there in the Bible, where it goes to Isaiah 53? 1,500 years after Abraham and Isaac, Isaiah foretold the coming of a Savior, a Messiah, who everyone else thought would be a great, strong, mighty war hero king. But this prophet said no. This one will take on our pain and bear our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by, the, by our wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led, here it is, like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. No one expected the Savior to be a lamb. But that's exactly what Isaiah foretold, that God would provide a lamb for the offering. 
that would be an atonement for all of our sins. Fast forward 600 more years when Jesus comes on the scene. He goes to be baptized in the River Jordan. His cousin, John the Baptist, is there. And how does John the Baptist introduce the Messiah to his listeners, to his followers? In John chapter 1, he says, Behold, here it is. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Listen, only when you understand this, that Jesus is the Lamb of God given freely by God, the sacrifice to end all sacrifices, can you even understand what God was doing in Genesis 22? The problem is, some of us get in such a skeptical mindset that we start to understand this, the Jesus stuff, through the lens of this, the stuff we don't understand, the child sacrifice stuff. What do we make of this? Right? And so we judge Jesus based on this instead of judging this based on Jesus. Jesus is the lens. Not this or Leviticus or Revelation or anything else that's super unclear and hard to understand. Let the clarity of the revelation of Jesus clear, clear up all the stuff that's harder to get. Sometimes we allow the waters to be muddied further darkened by the, the lack of clarity that we find here and here, and we don't spend any time looking here when this is the lens that clears everything else up. The experience of Jesus is what really will change your life. Some guy like me talking about the Bible, it's not going to save you. The Bible itself, the book, it's not going to save you. It'll supplement your salvation. But what will change your life is an authentic experience of God. You know, Jesus said that time, he said, seek and you'll find. I think what he meant is whatever you're looking for, you'll, you'll find it in life. And if you're in that agnostic state of mind and you're not really seeking anything, guess what you'll find? But if your heart is open, if you're willing to be interrupted, to let the status quo that you're living go, and to have a different life with different values, to start having different conversations with different company, and to concentrate on different things, higher things than the stuff you've been concentrating on. Like, if you're open to that experience, seek and you will find. You will. Find that experience, a personal encounter with Jesus that will change everything, including your view of Scripture. The problem is we love the status quo. So I know this life. This is easy. And churches will often encourage us to stay in our status quo. Churches will keep us there sometimes. Like, don't risk. Don't be a weirdo. Just be a normal Christian, and we'll all get along and have punch, and this will be great. Like, don't start flying off the handle and getting weird. No, Jesus, an encounter with Jesus will make you weird. I promise. Can't keep the status quo and the experience with Jesus. So are you open to the experience of Jesus? Do you realize how the status quo is just wearing you out? There are men in the room who are like, I've just got too much going on. I've got a reputation. No, nah, it doesn't matter. It's eating your lunch. You're not being who you really are yet. Not yet. And you know it. There are women who are saying the same thing. I've just got all these to-do lists and so much to, to worry about. And I just, I, I don't have time. There are students here going, I'm too young. I can't, whatever. No. Are you open to an experience of Jesus that will change everything? Seek and you will find. I think there are people, especially in areas like Houston, Texas, where most people grew up around Christianity, there are people who think, I've had that experience, and I, I let it go, and whatever, and now it's too late for me. Listen, Jesus came not to condemn, but to save. He is eager not to condemn you, but to save you. The doors on the bus are still open. You don't have to even have the right shirt on. You can be late, and it's fine. He wants to save you, not condemn you. Be open this season, this Christmas, today to an interruption from God. Be open like Abraham was open to his interruption. 
be open like Mary was open to her interruption. That's why we even have Christmas. Be open. Seek and you will find and he will change everything. Would you pray with me? Jesus, keep us open even though we're uh, really comfortable sometimes with the status quo. If we're honest, we like it the way that it is because we feel like we're in control and things are predictable. But Lord, we know that deeper beneath the surface, the status quo life is it's not the life we're called to live. There's more. It's a greater purpose. It's a greater life full of more meaning, stronger relationships, deeper conversations, a more purposeful prayer life. There's so much more, God, but we're afraid to take that step and to be interrupted. I pray for openness, especially for those of us who struggle with faith and doubt, just openness of heart to an experience of you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.